welcome those of you that are now tuning in online. And uh, for those of you that uh, online that are wondering why did we not do the whole service, we can't do uh, we can't do Facebook Live with our prayer request time, and uh, as that is a kind of a private moment, and so we decided uh, just to not do that at all. And uh, so we're going to start each week uh, broadcasting uh, just for our Bible study time. Maybe those last couple of songs that we're able to do. Um, So anyway, it is good to see everybody, and it is good to be back on Wednesday night. Uh, I shared with those that are here, and I share with all of you that are watching online right now, uh, I'm just thankful to not be doing this, well, I guess I am doing it in front of a camera. I just looked into a camera to say I'm thankful to not be doing this in front of a camera, but at least it's not me having to film myself. So uh, if you got your Bible... Turn over to Romans chapter 8. Now, I will give you fair warning. We got a mouthful of stuff to cover tonight. A lot. Okay? Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 7 and 8 are fantastic chapters. Now, those of you that have been keeping up each week with our videos, last week... Paul was talking in the seventh chapter about the bondage that he felt with the sin that was in his life. And what Paul said was, he said, all the things that God wants me to do, Paul said, I cannot find the time to get those things done. Now, I don't, I'll just simply have to say, I can say amen to that. The things that I know that I'm supposed to do, the things that I know that I'm supposed to fill my life up with, for some reason, I can't seem to get those things done. I used to blame it on just being so busy. A lot of times we do that. I'll talk to people about their uh, their relationship with God and their studying of God's Word and thought, well, you know, I'm just just too busy. I'm just too busy to... Uh, you know, I'm so tired when I finally get home at night. I sit down to read my Bible, to have my prayer time, and I just fall asleep and all those things. Well, I used to take that road as well. I used to think that until Paul said the next part in verse 7. He said, but all the things that I know that I'm not supposed to do, Paul says, I, I, have, I, I can't seem to find time to do the things that God wants me to do. But then Paul says, but you know, I I find ample time to do the things I'm not supposed to. And that was one of those areas in my life that really struck me, okay? Because no longer can do, I think, at least personally, can I ever use an excuse that I don't have time to do what God calls me to do because I make time and I provide resources a lot of times, and we do too, to participate in the things that we know God doesn't have for us in our life. And and so Paul does these things, and chapter 7 is a difficult chapter, but he ends the last two verses. The reason I want to go back to chapter 7, the last two verses of chapter 7 are are a launch into what's going to happen in chapter 8, okay? The last couple of verses of chapter 7, Paul says this. He says of himself, what a wretched man I am. And then he asks this question, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then he transitions. He transitions into what we're going to look at in the 8th chapter when he says this. He says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Chapter 8 is going to talk about, in fact, uh, I'm going to use it to talk about freedom. The bondage that we have in self, the bondage that we have in um, the sin, the bondage that we have under the law, compared to the freedom that we have in Christ. Now, there's something else that's important about chapter 8 that you that I want you to understand, and because in chapter 8, 19 times in these 30-something verses, 19 times it makes reference to the ministry of the Holy Spirit as he is 
providing for us and bringing up this freedom that we have in our lives. And so um, this is a great chapter when it talks about our freedom in Christ, but it's also a great chapter showing us the ministry of what the Holy Spirit does for us in our lives. And we're going to talk about that uh, as we go throughout this. So what I want to do is I want us to look at four freedoms that we have in Christ, okay? Now remember, Paul is piggybacking this after, after talking about the bondage that he has in the law. The bondage that he has in sin and the bondage that he has himself. Now he's going to contrast that with the freedom that we have as believers in Christ and the ministry of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives during these things. So let's look at four freedoms that we have in Christ. The first one is this. We have freedom from condemnation. Look at verses 1 through 4 of chapter 8. It says, therefore, now the word therefore, when you ever see that in the first of a chapter, that means that the writer is connecting everything that he said in that previous chapter. He's saying, all right, because of that, here we go. And so he says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. All right, what's the first freedom he says here? He says, you and I have freedom from condemnation. Notice that the basis in the first verse here, the basis of our freedom is in Christ Jesus. Now, what does that mean? I'll just tell you this. Outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ, you were in bondage to yourself. You were in bondage to sin. You were in bondage to everything that we found in the seventh chapter. You were in bondage to the third chapter when it says all of us have sinned. You were in bondage to the law as it talked about in 4, 5, and 6. You're in bondage to all of these things. But through a relationship that you and I have with God, through his son Jesus Christ, we can have freedom. Well, then he tells us this. He gives us three truths that Paul begins to share with us in verses 2, 3, and 4. The first thing he says is this. In verse 2, he says, the law cannot claim you. Look at verse 2 again. He says in verse 2, he says, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life, it says, has set us free from the law of sin and and death. The law cannot claim us. In the spirit, as it talks about here, you and I have a new life. When you trust Jesus Christ, and I'm going to reiterate this as we go tonight, when you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit begins to indwell in you. We're going to talk extensively about that as we get further through this chapter, okay? But when Christ Uh, When the Holy Spirit dwells in us is what gives us the ability to live out our life for Christ. Why? Because nothing in us can do that. There only can be a work inside of us, and that's what God does. And so uh, the law can't claim you. Uh, Verse 3, the law cannot condemn you. Look at verse 3 again. He says, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be the sin offering, he said. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. Why, does, why can the law not condemn you? Because Jesus condemned the law and condemned the sin in your life with what he did on the cross. Look over Flip over to uh, Colossians. I want to show you what, what it says about this. 
Colossians chapter 2. Should just be a, a few books over. Right after Philippians. Okay. This shows you the freedom that we have in Christ and how the law cannot condemn you. This is what it says in Colossians 2, 13 through 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all of our sins. Listen to this. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, and I love this part, he took it away and he nailed it to the cross. That, when it says it nailed it to the cross in the Greek language, that's the progressive tense there. And in other words, what that means is he took everything that was against you and nailed it to his cross. And the next verse there, it said when he did that, he disarmed everything that had power over you. And that goes back to verse 3 of Romans um, chapter 8. The law cannot condemn you if you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. In other words, if you are a Christian, the law cannot condemn you. Well, then there's verse 4. The law cannot control you. And this is important. Look at verse 4. He says, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The law cannot control you. Why? Because the Holy Spirit at work in your life is what enables you and I to be able to live a life pleasing to God. In other words, the law can't do those things. You and I... Out, that's why I keep saying this. I keep reiterating this. You and I cannot please God outside of a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. In other words, you cannot please God and not be a Christian. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit inside of you that is willing you to live the life that God wants you to do. Now, do we always follow what the Holy Spirit tells us to do? Well, we're going to cover that in a few minutes, okay? Because Scripture also talks about at that moment, there becomes a battle inside of us, a battle between the flesh and what the Holy Spirit wants for us. And I'll take it a little further. That is an exhausting battle. It's a battle that I go through every day of my life. It's a, <coughs> excuse me, it's a battle that Paul went through in the seventh chapter. When he said, I can't get done what I'm supposed to do, and I do everything I'm not supposed to do. That is this inward battle that Paul has going on in his life. Who is prompting him to do the things he's supposed to do? That's the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. Who is keeping him from doing those things? That is self. You see the battle? That's what happens over and over and over. So the law cannot control you. The Holy Spirit enables us to be able to walk in obedience to God's will, something we could not do apart from him. All right, let's, let's move on to this second one because I really, I've got to go as fast as possible tonight because if those of you that are looking, we've only covered four verses, okay? We've got a long way to go, all right? The second freedom that you and I have is this. We have freedom from what I put in here is just the obligation. And I'll explain that as we go, but let's, let's look through this. You and I can live in victory... Because we're not bound by our old nature. Paul describes this, and this is where I was talking to you just a second ago. Paul is about to describe for us three types of people. People who try to maneuver this life without the Holy Spirit at work in their life. People who were saved and have the Holy Spirit at work but do not allow the Holy Spirit to have control. And then there's people who have the Holy Spirit and are doing everything they can to live in accordance to what the Holy Spirit has for us in our lives. Three very different people, two of which are saved, one of which is doing what God has called us to do. Does that make sense? 
I think a lot of us fall in that middle category. So let's look at them, okay? Paul describes three kinds of people. The first one is this. Those who do not have the Spirit at work in them. This is verses 5 through 8. Now, let me put a, just kind of say this. Why would somebody not have the Spirit at work in their lives? Because they are not Christians, okay? If you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit has indwelled you. And he is at work in your life. Now, we're going to talk in just a second about the things that way that you and I can grieve what he's trying to do, but he's at work. So the only way that you can live a life where the Spirit is not at all at work in you is if you don't have the Spirit at all. You're not a Christian. Look at verses 5 through 8, okay? And, and interestingly, he's going to contrast what a life in the Spirit looks like compared to a life in the flesh. Look what he says. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. The mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. All right, let's think about it, okay? He does this contrast. He says, those who do not have the spirit at work in them. Uh, it, it says that they have the flesh at work instead of the spirit. Why? Because they're not Christians. So, preacher, are you saying that if you're not a Christian, you can't please God? Yes. That's what I'm saying. It's futile to try to live your life to please God when you don't know him. That's what he's saying here. He, he talks about this life in the flesh. He said it brings death where the one in the spirit brings life. He talks about uh, in verses 6 and 7. He says the life in the flesh puts you at war, at enmity, he says, with God. And a life in the spirit brings you peace. He says in verse 8, life in the flesh pleases the flesh. A life in the spirit pleases God. There's a vast contrast between these two. And what basically Paul is saying here is, apart from a relationship with Christ, you and I cannot please God. In fact, that's what it says in verse 9. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. God. Why? Because we don't know him. We've never trusted him. He doesn't have lordship of our life. The Holy Spirit's not dwelling in us. All right, well then he changes. That is the one of the three that does not know Christ at all. Now, the next one is talking about you and I as Christians, verse 9 through 11. And that is those of us who have the Spirit. Who is that? Everyone who is saved. Let's look at it, 9, 10, and 11. He says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. There it is, okay? So when you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit indwells in you and wills and works in you to bring about what God wants from you in your life, okay? It says, the realm of the Spirit, indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And it says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him uh, who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Okay, so we've moved from someone who has no spirit, the spirit is not at work in their life, in other words, they're not Christians, to now we're talking about Christians, and because you are Christian, the Holy Spirit indwells in you. Well, this goes back to what I said a second ago. Then there's a battle. There's a battle between what the Holy Spirit 
longs for us to do and what the flesh longs to do. Go back to chapter 7, Paul's battle. The battle. Now, I'm not going to ask anybody to give any um, testimony about these personal battles that you have in your life. I will tell you, I have them. I'm also not going to ask anybody to answer this question. For those of you who are Christians, and I put, I'm in that too, how many times have you allowed the self and the flesh to win the battle for what the Holy Spirit does in your life? We give in to ourself. Take you back to what I said in sermon a couple of weeks ago. Self is a whole lot easier than sacrifice. It really is. And so in those moments, what you and I do is we grieve the Holy Spirit. We do. I wish I could tell you that once you gave your life to Christ, that automatically you have no ability at all to do things that God doesn't want you to do. Well, but if that was the case, then in Romans chapter 7, Paul's not a Christian. And we know that not to be the case. And so he talks here, and it's those of us who have the Spirit. To be saved is the best thing that can ever happen. When we are saved, the Holy Spirit indwells within us and enables us to live a life pleasing to God. Every Christian has this. In other words, when you give your heart and life to Jesus Christ, you have lost the excuse that I just can't live for what God has for me. You've lost that excuse because the Holy Spirit is at work in your life willing you to be who God wants you to be. And there's a battle. Flesh and the Holy Spirit. Our old nature versus what God has for us in the new nature. And there's this battle. Well, then there's a third type person that, God, that, that uh, Paul talks about here, and that is this. We talked about those who have the Holy Spirit, and that comes through a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. But this third one he talks about is those whom the Holy Spirit has control over. And let's look at it. 12 through 17. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if we live according to the flesh, you will die, but if the, by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of your body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Do you hear the difference? The difference between having the Holy Spirit as indwelling in us and the difference in what it says in verse 14 for those of us who are led by the Spirit. It's a difference. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also, it says, share in his glory. It is possible. It is possible for you and I to grieve the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I can tell you that I'm living proof of that. Do we negate the work of the Holy Spirit? No. Are we more powerful than the work of the Holy Spirit? Of course not. But the thing that I've always learned is that God did not create us as robots, but he created us as a relationship. And God does not force us. Sometimes I wish he would. I'm just being honest. There are times when I just wish God would have said, when I gave my heart and life to him, God would just say, all right, 
You're never going to do another bad thing again. You don't have the ability. You can't do it anymore. That would be fantastic. But it's not how God did that. And the reason is because it's part of having a relationship. I don't just love Beth because she's my wife. I'm in love with Beth because I have a relationship with her that grows and that it's a pouring into each other. And that's what we're talking about here. There is a difference between being a Christian. In fact, I'll tell you how I've told my girls through the years. Um, you know, I asked them when they were little, I said, what, who do you think, what kind of guy do you think I would want you to date? And both of them would say, it would said, well, you want us to date a Christian. And I stopped them because I, I threw them off. I said, nope, that's not true. And they looked at me and went, what? I said, I don't want you to date a Christian. I want you to date a growing Christian. I want you to date a Christian that loves Christ far more than he loves you. That's the goal. And that's the difference here. That's what we find in this next part. Okay. Um, I've still got two points to go and ten minutes to get there, okay? Verses 18 through 30. We have freedom from frustration, all right? Uh, the best way to understand this section is to understand what I put here as kind of the three groanings that Paul talks about, okay? So let's, talk, let's look at this. First of all, Verses 18 through 22, Paul talks about the fact that creation is, is groaning for Christ. Look at 18 through 22. Um, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Here it is. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager anticipation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration but by, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. God's creation was good. And go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and you see that. When God created the heavens and the earth, it was good. When God said, let there be light, and he saw it was good. When God created man, and he said, in fact, it was very good. Creation was good. Man, in our choosing of sin, and as theologically it talks about Adamic sin, in other words, the sin of Adam... And because of all that, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Um, we live now in a fallen creation. We have sin. We have riots. We have struggles. We have hate. We have all of these things in our lives. We suffer with disease. We have death. All of these things. Why? Because we live in a fallen creation. But praise God, there will come a day when God is going to restore those things to new. Scripture calls it a new heaven, a new earth. That's pretty cool. John talked about it in the end of Revelation, talking about, and I saw coming forth a new heaven and a new earth. I've been asked before, what's that like? Well, I'm not real sure. But I know it's perfect. I know that it's perfect. I know that you'll never go and pick a rotten apple anymore. You won't have an apple and bite into it and have half a worm in it. You're not going to have those things. Why? Because it, is, it will be perfect in all of creation. Okay? 23 through 25. Not only does creation groan, but you and I as believers, we groan. Look at 23 through 25. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan, it says, inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. 
But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they've already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we will wait for it patiently. Creation groans, but we do. Through Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit, we have had the opportunity to experience at least a portion of his glory. Those of us that don't have a relationship with Christ have never experienced the glory of God. You and I have. You've had those times. You've had those moments. I've heard people define them as God moments, whatever you want to define it by. But you've had those moments when you've experienced the power and the grace and the mercy and the love of God in such a powerful way. And then we also look at a fallen creation. And we cry out and say, Lord Jesus, how long are you going to tarry? Come, Lord Jesus, come. We groan. We groan for his glory to be revealed. We groan for the pain of this earth to go away. We groan for these things. Well, there's a third thing. We're going to hurry through this. 25 through 30. Not only does creation groan and you and I groan, it says in these verses the Holy Spirit groans. Listen to 25 through 30. It says, but if we uh, hope for what we do not have yet, we wait for it patiently. It says in 26, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. When we, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through, world, through wordless excuse me groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance, it says, to the will of God. 28, 29, and 30. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined and to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, it says, he has glorified. All right? So, creation groans. You and I groan. And I like this part. It says the Holy Spirit groans. What does he groan for? He groans for you and I. I don't know how that makes you feel, but that makes me feel incredible knowing that the Holy Spirit in the midst of my weakness groans in prayer and interceding for me. In fact, it says when you and I don't have the words to say, the Holy Spirit says them for us. Praise God. Praise God that we serve a a Savior that loves us that much. The Holy Spirit, as he indwells within us, the Holy Spirit knows our weaknesses, yet he groans for us in prayer and drawing us back to God's will. You ever said, well, I was doing something, but my conscience got a hold of me. Well, let's name the conscience the Holy Spirit. Because I promise you, it's not your conscience. Your conscience is your flesh. And your flesh is not drawing you to serve God. It's the Holy Spirit. I tell people all the time. People will come to me, and they are they're living a life of sin. And they'll come to me and they'll say, I'm miserable every time I do this. And I throw them off because I always say, good. You want to hack somebody off when they tell you that they're miserable? Tell them, I'm glad you're miserable. But here's the thing. If you're living your life consumed with sin and the Holy Spirit is not convicting you of that sin, you know why? Go back to that first person we talked about. The Holy Spirit's not indwelling in you. That's why Scripture teaches that you and I as believers cannot continue in continuous sin. 
Now, we grieve this Holy Spirit at times, I, and I know that, okay? But the reason, and, and, and so now let's put it on the other side of that. Well, every time I do something, I feel guilty. Well, can I be honest with you? You feeling guilty about it doesn't, doesn't do anything for your sin. It's not you feeling guilty. It's not your conscience. It's the Holy Spirit at work in you, drawing you back to be a part of what God's will for you is. And he knows best. The Holy Spirit knows best what is for you. And so he works in us that way. All right. I got one minute to cover eight, no, ten verses. We're going to get there in three minutes. Freedom, it says, from separation. Verses 31 through 39. Listen, there's no condemnation because we share in his righteousness. There's no obligation Because through the Holy Spirit, we can overcome the flesh. There's no frustration because we share in God's glory and we anticipate his return. And we have no separation from God because of his great love. I want to read them to you. I want to read it all, then I'll just kind of go back and share them with you, okay? 31 down through 39, and we'll close with this. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. He says in verse 37, Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, uh, depth, excuse me, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise God. Praise God for that. Let me just tell you about God's love. Verse 31, God is for you. Verse 32, Jesus died for you. Verse 33, through Jesus Christ, you have been justified. Verse 34, the Lord intercedes for us. And I'll close it with this. The Lord loves you unconditionally. We covered a mouthful. I only went two minutes over. I told you it'd be three. See, I gave you a minute back. Anybody got any questions or comments? It's a lot in that chapter, okay? What I want to encourage you with to realize is that when you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit begins to indwell in you. And you and I must submit to him and his work in our lives. And I promise you, if we do so, it sure does make this life a lot easier, and it sure does make this life a lot more joyful. All right. Well, we're going to close. Sunday, we'll be back together. Two services again this Sunday, 8, 30, 10. It is Father's Day. I'll be preaching on David's mighty men and uh, looking forward to that. It's a, a sermon that I've been looking forward to for quite some time now. So um, so I encourage you, you be back here this Sunday. Invite somebody to come with you. We've got room to spread out. So, um, all right, let's, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father God, we do love you. We do thank you for today. And we thank you for your word. I thank you for the power of your word. And I thank you for the, the presence and the power and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives willing us to be who you've called us to be. And Lord, I just pray. I pray for each and every one of us, Lord, that we will live our lives sold out to you. 
God, you be glorified in everything we do and say, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You are dismissed. Thank you for being here.